action figures. I had G.I. Joe action figures. I had Transformers action figures. I had He-Man action figures. I had wrestling action figures. Mm -hmm. Some of these action figures I still have. Mm -hmm. And I don't play with them. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. Often. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the G.I. Joe action figure. And uh, my friend had an action figure that I really wanted. And um, I decided I was going to trade my action figure for his, which I did. And then my cousin told me, I had an older cousin who knew everything. If you have, maybe you have one of those too. But he told me that I had made a bad trade, so I guess he didn't approve of my trade. But that was one thing we did as kids. We trade action figures back and forth. Uh, we used to trade baseball cards back and forth. But when you get older, you really have an opportunity to trade in my old vehicle because it just wasn't going to run anymore. You know, it came to the point where it wasn't going to run and, and had too many miles and wasn't worth repairing. So I had to trade it in for a newer vehicle, and, and that was fine. It was just, a, you always want those vehicles to last a little bit longer, right? That's just the way it goes. But I want you to think about this. When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we need to remember that Jesus is offering you a trade. He's saying, I want you to trade your sin for salvation. I want you to trade death for life. I want you to trade hell for heaven. Because that's what it means that Jesus, that's why Jesus came. He came so that we could be forgiven. He came so that we could have salvation instead of sin. He came that we could have heaven instead of hell. He came so that we could have life instead of death. So when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are remembering that Jesus is offering us the greatest trade of all. Because really what he did was he traded spaces with us when he went to the cross. That should have been us suffering and dying for the sins we've committed. Instead, Jesus did that in our place. So it's the greatest trade proposal that has ever been offered. And he's offering it to you today and every single day. He's, he's traded everything that he can give so that you can have forgiveness and eternal life. Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. In John 12, 32. That's what he wants to do today. He wants you to draw him, draw you to him. He wants you to know that he loves you, he offers you forgiveness, he offers you salvation and eternal life. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll eat the bread and drink the cup together. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came and traded places with us. He went to the cross, he carried the cross when it should have been us taking the punishment. Jesus took the punishment in our place. Dear God, we pray that every time we partake of communion, we'll just think about that wonderful mercy and grace and love that Jesus offers to us. And we'll just think about that powerful name of Jesus that we just sang about, that he is our Lord and our Savior. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Let's take the bread and eat the bread and then drink the cup together. box on the wall and uh, that is a place where we uh, place our offerings on a weekly basis or however often you choose to give and we appreciate your giving we thank you for giving faithfully to the church we thank you for giving faithfully to missions uh, we give we give to God and to our community in other ways as well this uh, a few weeks ago we had a feeding the community event it's the third Friday of every month and this past uh, the last one we did about 10 days ago we had 89 meals that we served. We served 89 meals. That's the highest we've ever done. So we're thankful for that. We're excited for that. It's, a, it's amazing to see what God is doing, uh, using the church and using you and your efforts to bless other people. So uh, keep praying for that. Keep praying for that, uh, that we continue to help more people. And we know people have given money and time. People have cooked and volunteered. So we appreciate all your efforts to support that, that work that we do once a month. We also need to remember that 
two weeks from today is Easter Sunday, so please uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, think about people who could join you for that service on Easter Sunday. We uh, look forward to celebrating and worshiping together on Easter Sunday. And uh, we, we do feed the community, but we also want you to know that we want to feed you as well. Uh, hopefully you saw in your bulletin, uh, there's an insert talking about a pancake bref breakfast that we're going to do uh, the week after Easter. So basically, if you have friends or family join you on Easter, everybody's welcome to come back and join us again for pancake breakfast on April 16th. If you're in the habit of coming to this service, we would encourage you to come earlier, um, come during first service time. We'll meet down the hall in the classrooms, we'll be serving pancakes. And if you're willing to help serve pancakes, we would also appreciate that. Everybody is welcome to come eat. We just need a few people to come and help serve. So we'll have, you'll have pancakes during the first service time, and uh, then you can come to church after that. So we encourage you to be a part of that. Please uh, fill out that insert, place it in the offering box, either today or next week, as soon as you can. And uh, we just want to you know, bless any Easter guests that we have by encouraging them to come back uh, for pancakes the following week. So uh, please keep track of that. There's a lot of things going on, and um, we just thank God that he's uh, doing great things in our community and in our church, and that we get to be a part of his uh, work here in the community. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer for our offering, and then we'll get into the Gospel of Mark. Dear Lord God, thank you for the generosity of our church. We thank you for your generosity, because it all begins with you. The blessings we have in life, the talents and abilities that you give to us, Lord, <coughs> Uh, we just pray that we would be faithful in giving, that we would be faithful in helping other people. And Lord, we, uh, we thank you that when we give, we, we can impact so many people in so many places that we need to be uh, constantly giving because we know that you're going to meet those needs of people in our community and across the world. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to Mark chapter 12. If you have a journal, if you have your Bible, if you have a, a phone, uh, we, we're going to get into Mark chapter 12 today. But I want you to think about events in your life that last for about seven days. Usually uh, it's good to go away on a seven-day vacation. That's usually about how much time uh, we get uh, for vacation, we take a week's vacation. A lot of kids and you know students and teachers just had spring break, which lasts for a week. Never seems long enough but it lasts for about a week uh, usually when people go on a honeymoon it lasts for about a week or if you get to go on a cruise ideally it lasts for uh, seven days uh, some kids go to camp for a week and everybody loves to watch shark week on television right okay so there are things that last for seven days and the reason why I bring up all these different things that last for seven days is because when we get into this this part of the Gospel of Mark Everything we talk about from now on is the, the last seven days of Jesus. Everything from here on out takes place during the last seven days of Jesus. So keep that in mind. We're looking at the last seven days of Jesus as we come into Mark chapter 12. And on the screen, there's a picture of a uh, Bible professor, a Bible teacher. His name was R.C. Foster, and he would teach on the life of Jesus for three years. His college course on the life of Jesus would he would spend one full year on the last week of Jesus. In fact, one time a student questioned him about it, and they said, how can you spend a whole year talking about one week? You know, it's only seven days. How do you spend a whole year talking about one week? And uh, R.C. Foster told this student, well, you just need to wait and see. Now, the interesting part of that story is the student who was questioning him at his desk was his own son, Lewis Foster. How can you spend a whole year on one week, Dad? Uh, but that's what we're going to find out. There's so much to learn, so much to study. Whether you read through the Gospel of Mark on your own, the part that you're going to hear in church, the, uh, the passages you'll study in your small groups, everything we talk about over the next few weeks comes from the uh, final week of Jesus. So let's get into Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28 where Jesus will tell us what are the two greatest commands. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Which commandment is the most important of all? This is a scribe who comes to Jesus with a question. Usually, 
when scribes came to Jesus with a question, they were trying to trick him, or they were trying to trap him. They didn't have good intentions. But this uh, this scribe wants to come to Jesus because he and a scribe. You might be thinking, well, what did a scribe do? Well, basically, their name says it all. A scribe, their responsibility was to take the law of God and to copy it. And they would make copy after copy, writing it down, one word, one line, one letter, one after the other. That was their job. That was their work. And if you were copying a, if you were copying the law of God and you made a mistake, you had to throw it away because they wanted to make sure that the laws of God were copied down perfectly. They didn't want to have any errors or any mistakes or anything like that. So they were very meticulous, not just about copying the law, but they also wanted to be very meticulous and careful when it came to obeying the law. And I think that's what this scribe is doing. He wants to make sure that he's obeying the laws of God in the right way. And you'll also notice in that verse, it says that the scribe heard them disputing with one another. It seems like every religious group was coming up to Jesus and asking him a question, trying to trick him, trying to trap him. So he heard their disputing. That was the way they that was the way they talked about stuff. They would dispute, they would argue, they would go back and forth. And uh, really that's still going on in our world today. If you watch political shows, even if you listen to sports radio, they always have two different two different people arguing their opinions back and forth. And it even happens on social media as well. So the disputing continues, but we need to remember that as it's, that's not the goal. The goal is to help win people to Jesus Christ. That should be our primary goal, to win people to Jesus. In fact, here's what Jesus said about it. In Luke 15, 10, Jesus said, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One sinner will cause heaven to rejoice if they turn back to God. So that's our goal, to win people. The person, we want to win the person to Jesus Christ. We want to win people back into a proper and healthy relationship with God. So this scribe comes to Jesus. He wants to know which commandment is the most important of all. He's not saying, Jesus, which commandments should I obey and which ones can I disregard? That's not his attitude. He wants to know which one is the most important, which one is the top priority. Which one is the foundation for, the, for all the others? Because the scribes loved the first five books of Moses. The scribes would pay careful attention to those first five books of Moses. And in the first five books of Moses, there were 613 commands. 613 commands in the five books of Moses. And this uh, scribe says, Jesus, can you narrow it down to one? Which commandment is the most important of all? Verse 29, Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And uh, this verse was very familiar to a Jewish person. The scribe would have instantly recognized this verse that Jesus recited to him. It comes from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. A Jewish person, including this scribe, would have prayed this verse every morning and every evening. That was a, a regular habit in their prayer life. This is a verse that parents would teach to their children. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The first word of the verse is the word hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the Hebrew word for hear is Shema. So that's what they called this prayer. They called it the Shema. Shema means hear, and hear is the first word of the verse. And that's what they needed to do. They needed to hear God. They needed to pay attention to God. They needed to focus on God and listen to God. It was so important for them to listen to and to obey God in their everyday lives. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We don't always hear very well, do we? Right? We don't always hear very well. Um, sometimes we don't always get the message that's coming through to us. When you deal with children or grandchildren, if you're a teacher who deals with students, it's so important that children hear and listen and understand because if they're not hearing and listening, they're probably not going to follow through and do the right thing. Correct? That happens all the time. Um, 
I'd like to tell you a story uh, from when I was a, uh, a young kid. I think looking back, it's probably the only time I didn't listen as a kid. No, that can't be true. <laughs> there are lots of times I didn't listen. But I remember being in school and uh, a lot of times, well, on this, on this occasion, our teacher gave us an assignment and she said, you're going to do this assignment right now before you leave. And it's 20 questions. She said, make sure you read every question before you answer any of them. Read every question before you answer any of them. Now, did you hear those instructions? Read every question before you answer any of them. Now, I heard those directions. And as soon as she finished talking, she said, you know, you can start. So you know what I did? I looked at number one and I answered it. And number two, and number three, and I'm, I'm going down the paper. I'm, I'm, you know, making good time. You know, number 12, number 18, 19, and 20. And number 20 says, all you need to do is write your name on the paper and turn it over. <laughs> you know how I felt that day? I was not happy with myself. You know how unhappy with myself I was? 40 years later, I'm still talking about it, okay? <laughs> yeah. But you know what the problem was? Was the problem with the teacher? No. 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 Was the problem with the way she gave the, 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 the directions? No. The problem was with me. I heard, but I didn't listen. I heard, but I didn't obey. And that's why the first word of this verse is here. We need to make sure we are hearing God. Are we listening to God? Are we paying attention to what God is communicating to us? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And I think one might be God's favorite number because I'm going to, we're going to look at a verse, a, a few verses that highlight how God is all about the number one. Ephesians chapter four, verse four, it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this passage mentions all kinds of things that there's only one of. There's only one body, the church. That means the church all around the world. There's one spirit, the Holy Spirit. There's one hope. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. There's one Lord. Again, that's Jesus Christ. There's one faith. We believe in God. There's one baptism, being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins sins in Jesus name there's one God and father of all all of these things one body one spirit one Lord one hope one faith one baptism one God one father just reminding us of the unity of God that's Jesus wanting to get their attention hero Israel the Lord our God the Lord now Jesus hopefully has them listening hopefully we're listening to what Jesus says in verse 30 mark 12 verse 30 and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Have you ever sat back and just thought for a minute? When you read that verse, what does God want you to do? He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him. And I think sometimes we get a little too academic and we don't think about this. God wants you to love him. God loves you. And no one will ever love you the way God does. I know sometimes it's hard for us to accept that. But it's true. It's true. God's love for you is unfailing and unconditional. And Jesus says God wants you to love him. God loved you first. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him back. God, Jesus says, love the Lord with all. Love the Lord with all. If you're going to love God, you have to love him with everything. Well, there's parts of us that aren't very lovable. Well, God loves you anyway. That's why Jesus came to this world in the first place. So you have to love God with all. You don't hold back. You can't withhold anything back from God. God doesn't hold back from you. So how can you hold back from him? Love the Lord your God with all. Then we have the word your, because God wants your heart and my heart. God created all of us. He wants your heart, my heart. He wants the heart of everybody. You get to love him individually. And then the word and. 
Jesus doesn't say you can love God with your heart or your mind or your soul or your strength. He says they're all together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Every part of your being. It's not about a feeling. It's about a decision. It's about a choice. It's about an action. You think about how God loves you and God wants you to do the same. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. What does it mean to love God with all of our hearts? What does the heart do for us in the human body? The heart gives us life. When we talk about the heart, when we talk about doing things from the heart, that means we do them with passion and with love, right? Valentine's Day was last month. You know, we talk about love and, and affection, and there's hearts everywhere. Now, when we celebrate Valentine's Day, and we hang up hearts. Do those hearts look anything like the real heart inside of us? No. If you hung pictures of a human heart on Valentine's Day, what would happen? People would get sick, right? It's 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 disgusting. It does, you know, it does great things for us, but it's pretty gross if you think about it. But that's that's just what that's what Jesus is saying. We love him. It's like we can't really live. You can't live without your heart. You can't function without your heart. You will die without your heart. So Jesus says that loving him with our heart is the difference between life and death. The heart gives life. We should love Jesus and love God passionately. But we're also supposed to love God with our soul and with our soul. Because we are spiritual beings. There's a spiritual part of you that lives forever, that lives for eternity. The physical part of us is going to die. It's going to be gone. The spiritual side of us is important. Loving God is a spiritual endeavor. We love God with our mind. We love him mentally. We don't follow God blindly. We study his word. We love him mentally by looking into the Bible. And we love God with our strength physically. We're called to serve God and obey God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And in Mark 12, 31, Jesus continues. Mark 12, 31, Jesus says, The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So we could be, we could be experts in loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. But if we don't love other people, it's not enough. Jesus says we have to do both. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love God in isolation. If you want to understand more about loving God, or not loving God, excuse me. If you want to understand more about loving your neighbor, Jesus gave us a parable about it. He gave us a, a lesson about it. He gave us a story. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. I would encourage you to read it. Because it reminds us that we need to love our neighbor. We need to love people who are in need. The reason I need to love people in need is because that's what, that's what they need at that moment. They need love. And hopefully someone will love me back in my moment of need. That's what we do. You love your neighbor as yourself. You can't say, yes, I love the Lord, but no, I don't really love people. You can't say, yes, I love Jesus, but no, I don't love the church. We can't ignore the command to love our neighbor. In fact, I'd like you to see what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, where John says this, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. Loving God and loving our neighbor go hand in hand. John says, if you can't love people, how can you love God? You see people, you deal with people, you have relationships with people, you're called to love them. You can't accept love from God and then withhold love from other people. Now, we want to uh, love one another. That's one of our goals at our church. We want to obey these commands in our lives as individual Christians, but also as a, a church collectively. And we feel that one of the 
one of the ways that we can love one another is by being a part of a small group. So we encourage people to be part of small groups. And uh, this past, the past few months, we've been studying the Gospel of Mark in small groups. But right after Easter, we're going to start a, a short study in the book of Esther. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a six-week study. It's not a long study. So if you've never tried a small group, we would encourage you to try one during that study as we do the book of Esther. We'll have journals for the book of Esther. We'll have video teaching in small groups on the book of Esther. So if you've been waiting for an opportunity to join a small group, and you can, if you're willing to do it for six weeks, we would love for you to be a part of those small groups uh, during those six weeks uh, during doing the book of Esther. Because we feel that when we meet together in a smaller group, smaller than church, it's an opportunity for us to love one another and encourage one another, pray for one another, serve one another, and accept one another. So we would encourage you to be a part of that. Let's find out what the scribe says to Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verse 32. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Aren't you encouraged that the scribe told Jesus that he was correct? <laughs> right? You're right, Jesus. Good job. I'm glad the scribe gave Jesus a thumbs up. And he said, you know what? Jesus, you're right. We are supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we should love our neighbor as yourself. But here's the part where they struggled. Here's the part where we struggle. It's important that we know, but it's much more important for us to obey them. It's easy to know them. It's more important for us to obey them. In fact, watch what Jesus says in verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Does anything trouble you about what Jesus said to the man? What did Jesus tell him? You're not far from the kingdom of God. Do you think that's what he wanted to hear? You're close to death. Probably not. Probably not. I think the answer that he would have heard, he would have preferred Jesus to say is, you're in the kingdom of God. But if we're in the kingdom of God, you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to love him, and he wants us to love our neighbor. That's how we demonstrate that we belong to the kingdom of God. We have to enter into the kingdom of God only by Jesus. And then we are called and commanded to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. I don't want Jesus to say that we're close to the kingdom. I would want him to say, you're in the kingdom and you're doing what God has told you to do. So hopefully this is just a reminder to us that God wants us to love him above everything else and he wants us to love our neighbor. Jesus said there's no commandment greater than those. If you're ready to take a step into the kingdom of God, if you're ready to uh, surrender your life to Jesus Christ, today would be the day to do it. Jesus said there's rejoicing over one sinner who repents and turns to God. So maybe today is the day that you turn to God and turn away from your sin, you turn away from your past. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that as we uh, stand and sing our invitation song. It's a song called Change My Heart, O God. So if today's the day that you want to uh, enter into the kingdom of God, we would encourage you to do that. We're going to stand together and sing that song, Change My Heart, O God.
God, we pray that you would take all of our hearts and mold them and shape them to be more like Jesus Christ. We pray that we would love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to uh, live out those commands, Lord. Help us to uh, live in your kingdom. We want to be in your kingdom, Lord. We don't want to just be close to the kingdom. We want to be part of it. Lord, we want to offer a, a special prayer today for Pastor Ingram pastor here in Deland who has been diagnosed with cancer and we pray uh, for him and his church that you would give them healing and strength and guidance during this time uh, Lord we, uh, we thank you that we've had the chance to be here today to worship you and Father uh, we want to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and we thank you that you loved us help us to go out of this place and love our neighbor because you love us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.